All right, welcome back in. 609-919-9200. This is the Zach Gelb Show right here on Fox Sports. 920 the jersey. A big night in the NBA with the draft and an even bigger night in Philadelphia as the Philadelphia 76ers have the number one overall pick after the trade with the Celtics. And they will select Markel Fultz, a guard out of Washington, with the number one overall pick tonight. Let's go out to the hotline right now and welcome in Jake Pavorsky from Liberty Ballers. Of course, Jake Pavorsky being a very loyal, trust the process kind of guy. And he joins us right now. Jake, happy draft night. Appreciate a few minutes. Thanks for the time. And how are you? I'm doing good, Zach. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you for coming on, and we appreciate it. So Markel Fultz is going to be the pick at number one. We know the trade did happen over the weekend and was finalized on Monday. What type of player do you think the Sixers are getting in Markel Fultz? What I think the Sixers are getting is a multi-time all-star caliber player. He's a guy who fits in perfectly with his young cores, exactly what this team needs. We know how great of a ball handler Ben Simmons is, and he'll probably be the primary ball handler on this team. But with the beauty of Markel Fultz is he's a guy who can play on-ball beat him, who can run the pick and roll, but can also play off-ball next to Ben Simmons as like a, a guy coming off screens who can do catch-and-shoot threes, can run the side pick and roll, like a secondary initiator. So he fits in perfectly with both Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Robert Covington, all those guys. He is the perfect last piece for this young core. Now, I agree with everything you just said, but let's get into the concerns. And obviously, we don't get to see a lot of Washington games, but we hear about how he could improve defensively and the free throw percentage. How about those two areas of his game? Yeah, I agree. I think the defense is definitely the biggest concern with him. With him. I mean, he's got all the tools. He's long as, uh, as all hell. He, he can. You, you see the chase down blocks on the, on defense. He'll get back, and he'll, he'll try and make highly plays like that. But in the half court, it's something that he'll really need to learn to adjust. Luckily, he's got a great defensively-minded coach in Brett Brown. will make him realize that it, this team uh, relies on defense first to get everything else going. Uh, and I think Joel Embiid is a guy as an on-four leader who loves playing defense. Uh, we'll, we'll get that through his head as well. So I don't think that'll be a huge issue. It's just about getting him in the right spots and having him figure that out, and that will come with time. Uh, in terms of him you know, not being a winner at Washington and people point to the nine wins, uh, this is a guy who won a gold medal with the U9, U18 USA team uh, just a couple summers ago, was the leader on that team, which is how his meteoric rise started. I think he said he lost maybe four games during his two years of varsity at the Mata High School in D.C. So, I, you know, you look at that stuff, and I think that's very overblown in the same way that, you know, people talk about Ben Simmons not being a winner last year. Uh, but you look at the core of that, that Washington team as well. That LSU team that Ben Simmons was on probably have blown that Washington team out by 20. They were absolutely horrendous. So those are issues that I think are, are pretty minor in the grand scheme of things and probably won't have much of an effect on, on Fultz in the, in the long term. Why do you think, though, because I understand with the uh, nine wins thing, and we've had some people on that know him, and they've dismissed that, and then we've had some people on uh, that coached, uh, like Seth Greenberg and Lionel Hollins, and they've made a big deal out of it. It seems like, though, last year it got a little bit more play with Simmons and not that much this year. Do you agree with that? I, I think it, it did, and that's probably because people were looking at Ben Simmons as like that first big talent since LeBron James. And, uh, that was the big name that they compared him to, so I think they put him under that microscope similarly. Uh, to that of uh, LeBron. But either way, I think, you know, you look at the, the situation that Markel came into, and he would expect to be playing with Marquise Chris and DeJounte Murray, and those two guys bounce for the NBA. That team, you know, makes a dramatic change roster-wise, and he's basically playing as Kevin O'Connor from the, the Ringer put it. He's playing with Twitter eggs. Uh, so, it, you know, there just wasn't any talent on that team. And the, the beauty of it is I think he can come into this team, and he doesn't need to be that guy. You had Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. Those guys can share the ball, can share, you know, the leadership and the blame, however it falls. So I don't think there's there's going to be too much of an issue there. A lot of it, just like with Ben last year, is very overblown. Yeah, I agree. I think it is overblown. And we had Rafael Chilius on earlier in the week, and he was telling us that he couldn't have done any more besides of uh, maybe taking the basketball from the guys that he passed it and shooting it again and uh, finishing off those makes for those guys as uh, Jake Pavorsky joins us right now. The learning curve. I know Simmons had a year to watch with the injury. Uh, what do you think the learning curve will be for Ben Simmons and Markel Fultz and they finally step on the court uh, come the start of the season? I think the learning curve is finding how they can play together, who you know, how they work together on ball, off ball. It's just about building chemistry, and it's going to take a couple months to do that. It's going to be the same with Joel Embiid trying to figure out how those guys all complement each other. So there's definitely going to be a learning curve in that regard, and obviously there's there's figuring out you know how to play defense and you know learning the switches and stuff like that. It's so it's all going to be you know a process as you know it's, it's the buzzword around the Sixers, but it's going to be a learning process trying to get these guys to mesh together. It'll take you know a couple months of the game. You know we'll see some some ups and some downs, and people will probably get concerned as they do in Philadelphia. But it's part of the natural natural progression of guys who you know are just getting past the, the age of being teenagers. Uh, they'll get through it eventually, and uh, it'll all work itself out. Again, very on paper, very very complimentary players. 
All right, we see the rumors uh, that did circulate this morning. 36 and 39 could be moved, according to David Aldridge, and they may move up into the 20s. If that is a move that the Sixers do make, uh, who could they be targeting in the 20s? Uh, there's a, a couple of swing men on the, on the 20s that I really like. Semi Ogilvy from SMU is a guy that I think would be a pretty good fit for the team that could probably need another wing. So he can play the three, can play the small ball four. Kind of very similar player uh, to Robert Covington in terms of build and, and stylistically. Uh, can shoot the three ball really well. That's a guy that I would like. And I wouldn't mind taking a look at another guard. Trent Jackson from Duke is a guy who was basically forced out of there because they were bringing in another five-star recruit. But he's uh, shown you know, progress as a scorer at Duke at a 42-inch max vertical at the combine, which was third best. It's going to take some time to really hone his point guard skills. Uh, but that's another guy who I think could be a very strong backup on this team going forward. Uh, if you give him a couple of years and let him spend some time in, in the G League. Uh, those, those are two guys that I think would make sense, a lot of sense in the late 20s. We know that this team, they need another shooting guard, and maybe they turn to J.J. Redick uh, in free agency. Malik Monk, though, his stock seems like it's been falling. If he's there at 9 or 10, uh, what do you think it would take from the Sixers to maybe trade up into the top 10 and draft Malik Monk and get both uh, Fultz and Monk? It would take a lot. Uh, you know, making that move from the, the late second round to try and get up there, it would probably take, you know, they could, they can technically move that Lakers pick still because they own it between from uh, pick number one and between six and 30. They still have the option to move that. So I imagine it would probably take, you know, moving that option of protection six to, through 30 as well as 36 and maybe another piece like Julia Lope before, uh, Stauskas and other throwing like that. It, it, it's a big price, and frankly, I'm not sure if it really makes that much sense for this team. You can go out in free agency and find a guy who can fill in that role, uh, like a J.J. Redick, who I wouldn't mind on an overpay for two or three years because he's a sharpshooter and would fit a need for this team. Uh, I, I do like Malik Monk, but at the price you're paying to try and make the move up there, as well as the ceiling being a lot lower than most of the top prospects in this class, I'm not sure if it makes that much sense, especially when there should be some shooters uh, in the later portion of the draft as well that you could try and find uh, in the second round. So I, I, it's not a move that I would I would be fond of. What do you think the future is of one Dario Sarge, Jake? I think Dario probably maxes out as a really good six-man in the NBA. I, th I think that athletically he's going to get exposed a little bit defensively. He, he makes up for what he lacks in, uh, in athletics in, in terms of energy and, and leadership on that and strong you know, battle down low. Uh, but the way this core is growing, the way the Sixers are, are being built, uh, Ben Simmons is technically going to be your starting power forward, at least in terms of on the defensive end of the ball, which is going to slot Dario Sarge onto the bench. And I like him being that first guy coming off the bench, a guy who is sort of similar stylistically to Ben in the sense that he can handle the ball if you run the offense a little bit. You saw with some guys uh, were falling due to injury last year that Dario really picked up the slack. As terms of, in terms of being a playmaker. Uh, so I think that that's a role could, that could very much suit him well. And he could be like a super sub coming off the bench. You have you know, a really strong six-man unit, uh, and then he could be a part of that. So I, I definitely see him as a big piece of this team going forward and, uh, and really being that first guy off the bench that can make a difference in the second unit. We're talking to Jake Pavorsky right now. I know this is a very divisive topic uh, in the process versus anti-process nation. Uh, your approval rating right now for Brian Colangelo is what? It, it's height. I would say if we're going to put it on like a scale of one to ten, I'm going to say like a six, six and a half. I, I think of what he did in this Markel Fultz trade was phenomenal. He, he, you know, went to negotiations with Danny Age, a known stickler, a guy who's been known to leak out information to try and you know drive up the market. Who's not been, you know, one of the, the GMs that they'll tell you is very easy to deal with. And Colangelo, you know, despite his spotty track record in terms of making trades back in Toronto, went into negotiations with Ainge and, uh, and dominated him, I think. He, he got a deal that was very fair, made a move up from 3-1 to one where the, the difference in, in prospects is, is severe. Uh, Markel Fultz is far and away the best player in this draft. I think there is a big difference between him and Alonzo Ball and Josh Jackson. It, it's a fantastic move. And then you look at his comments in the press conference after uh, when he's talking about acquiring the pick. Uh, people ask him about free agency, and he says, well, you know, if we're not ready yet, then we'll wait. We don't need to make a big splash this summer. Uh, we like having the versatility of our, our picks and our cap space, and they have a ton of cap space going forward. And I like where his head at is at in terms of building the team, making sure this young core is ready to grow before actually making a move for a big-name free agent. You know, maybe they can do something like that next summer, but he seems patient and waiting for these guys to grow amongst each other. 
And I really like what I hear when it says like, stuff like that. So I, it's definitely higher than it was last year. And I'm starting to grow more confident that he can be the right guy to lead this team into the future. There's no question this past year was a really bad look uh, for one Brian Colangelo. But this deal definitely has won over the fan base, especially with the way that you were talking about the protections. I'm still in awe that the Celtics accepted that trade. And the Celtics will still probably uh, benefit from the trade in some capacity. Uh, but getting back to what you were saying about Fultz, uh, when you think he's so much of a difference and he's so much better uh, than a ball or Jackson. What are the differences for you uh, with Fultz compared to those other two players? It's, it's athletically, it's ball handling skills, it's ability to score. I like Lonzo Ball. I, I, if he was there at three, I would have been very comfortable with taking him. But you look at, I think that, you know, in terms of creating his own shot, he's going to be a very limited guy. He's a guy who can't really score going to his right. He's not going to be able to shoot pull-up jumpers like Martel can. He's not, he wasn't really adept at getting to the rim in college. I think he might be able to do that at the next level. But it was something that he wasn't really comfortable with, at least wasn't interested in doing while he was at UCLA. His, his main thing was pulling up for long threes. Well, Martel Foles is a guy who can score at all three levels. The mid-range, shooting threes, getting to the rim. So I think that really separates him from, from Lonzo, especially a guy like Josh Jackson who just can't shoot the ball at all. You heard about his workouts with the Los Angeles Lakers. He went through two of them, couldn't handle the ball at all. Uh, it was a terrible shooter. And that's something that, you know, the guy who shot 55% from the line, and you know, it's, it's going to be a struggle for a guy like Josh Jackson to really become a solid scorer at the NBA level. So that's what's something that really just separates them. It's, it's just the versatility on offense and the ability to score and pass. And just the way he plays, the fluidity, he just looks so smooth doing it. Everything that Marcel does just looks very natural in that he's you known for a guy at his young age so uh, mature and improved in the way that he plays. Uh, it, it's just they don't compare. None of these guys compare to Marcel. Jake, being one of the loyal guys that have uh, trusted the process uh, that you have been uh, with the work with the uh, podcast and then also Liberty Ballers, uh, just can you just give me a little bit perspective of what this week has been like with the retweet Armageddon, the trade, and just some of these emotions that you've been experiencing as a Sixer fan that it finally looks like this process, a lot of people are finally starting to give it credit. Yeah, it's awesome. I think it's really it, – it, it's it's vindication for basically for Sam Hinkie, I think, for the people that followed all this throughout, through the process, trusters that went through four years of terrible losing. You know, I, I think that people really look down – on what not only what the Sixers did, what Sam Hickey did, but the people that followed, you know, the team and supported Sam's plan. They made us look like a cult. They almost made us look like idiots at times. Well, hold and, on, and you, you guys are a cult. You guys are a cult. It's a good cult, but you're still a cult. <laughs> sure. Okay, I'll take that. But in a sense, they, they made us look like that. You know, we I get had what you're saying. Intention. Like the village right. idiots. Right. Basically, that was it. That we were just kind of blindly following the leader, and uh, I think that um, it was a very uh, you know, trying time over the past four years. But what I think is this, this move showed that what Sam Hinkie was doing uh, it really uh, was smart and was great at, at building this team going forward. And this weekend and the move that it's created has only proved that you know, the first part of Hinkie's plan was to create uh, a superstar team of guys, of young players that can really connect very well together. And he was doing that. This is the first part of the plan has officially come together. Uh, so it's vindication for what he was doing. And now the next step is taking place where the team is actually going to be able to grow and compete for a title. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a great moment for the city of Philadelphia. It's, it's a city that has really wanted to see good basketball, and they're finally going to get it. And the 14,000 season tickets are unbelievable, and it's just showing how excited this fan base is uh, to the, see the uh, Sixers being competitive again. We talk about that next step. Let's get past the draft, free agency. Uh, what do you anticipate this team to do in free agency? I think we'll make some moves for some guys on placeholder type contracts that won't really uh, blow the budget up. They'll be short-term kind of deals, just what they did last year with Gerald Henderson and Jared Bayless. I think a guy like maybe a James Johnson could make some sense. Joe Ingles from Utah is a restricted free agent, who I would be interested in throwing some money at on like a two- or three-year deal. Uh, would make sense as a backup for Robert Covington. Uh, and, and maybe J.J. Reddick is the highest we'll go in terms of going out and getting like a marquee-type free agent. But when you look at the Ken Pavies, Caldwell Pokes, the Kyle Lowry, the Otto Porters, those just darn guys that will be interested at this juncture where the team is being built. You look at the situation that the Knicks are in right now, if you head up the turnpike, it's a disaster one, uh, to say the least. Uh, Phil Jackson has been a complete and utter joke uh, with this organization. Uh, there's a lot of rumors, though, about Porzingis. I don't expect, I know there's some reports that uh, the Sixers are making inquiries about it. I don't think that will come to fruition. Uh, at the end of tonight, do you believe that Porzingis is still on the Knicks or no? Yeah, I think he'll still be on the Knicks. From what I understand, I think that, that trade conversations are being a little overblown, although Phil Jackson is doing a fantastic job of alienating the best players that they have on the team and the only guys that they really should be building around. 
Uh, but my understanding is that the uh, the asking price for Port Zingas is just ridiculously high. And I think that the only team that would could really match that is Boston. Uh, and I don't necessarily know if that is the guy that they have uh, in their targets right now. I think that they'll probably uh, wait it out a little bit. And I, I know it, it just doesn't really make sense for, for New York to try and make a move like this. When you look at, at the team and, and where they're headed right now, they need an identity. They need somebody to build around. And Chris Tapp is that guy. Whether he missed an extra meeting or not, is, you know, it shouldn't come into this decision-making of whether or not to keep him. He's a tremendous player. He's a guy who could be you know, a franchise cornerstone. And I, I think he's too valuable to give up. And I think the asking price is going to reflect that. So that way, uh, New York just basically wouldn't be able to move him. It's just going to be too much for any team to match. If the Celtics and Knicks don't make a trade for Porzingis, and let's say they stay with the picks they have right now in the draft, uh, who do you think the Celtics will take at three? And how about the Knicks at eight? It sounds like it's going to be Jason Tatum at three. Uh, Duke. We'll see if they actually keep that. Uh, I think that my understanding was that Boston was going to try and make a deal. Uh, you know, once they got the extra picks from Philadelphia, they were going to try to move them to maybe a Chicago uh, for Jimmy Butler. So we'll see if they actually end up keeping the pick. But Jason Tatum is a guy that would make sense, would give them another scorer on the wing. He can play the three. I think he's probably best in a small ball four. Uh, and with Kelly Olenek being a free agent, I think he could slide in there very well. Uh, in terms of what the Knicks might do, they need a guy who can who can run the triangle. Uh, it could quite possibly be Frank Milakina uh, from Strasbourg in France. Uh, 18-year-old kid. He's going to be the second youngest player in the draft. But playing at a very high level in France and one of the better leagues in Europe. He can play on ball, can play off ball. He fits all the qualities of the triangle. Uh, very long. He's, he's going to work on his on ball defense, uh, but is good in getting in front of passing lanes and turning defense into offense. Uh, I think that's a guy that would definitely make sense for the Knicks and uh, someone that they should be happy with as well. Dennis Smith Jr. Uh, from NC State is another guy that could be in consideration. Uh, but I think if, if you're going to be focusing on the triangle, as I know the Knicks are, then I would take Nita Pino over Smith. And then finally, let's get back to your boy Sam Hinkie. Uh, what's his next move? Where's Sam Hinkie going to be next? We'll, we'll see about that. It's, it's, I think his, his next gig is probably going to be an assistant GM that work his, back, his way back up to the top um, through another front office. But I think that what he's shown or what has happened with the Sixers team has shown that he was on the right track, that he was doing the right thing, uh, and that this job that he had in Philadelphia was basically taken away from him before the entire plan could come to fruition. And now that, you know, the stigma of Sam Hankey is sort of passed over the, couple, the, over the year or two. Uh, his non-compete is up with Philadelphia, and people are realizing that what Philadelphia is putting together is actually special. Uh, I think it will allow another front office to, to bring him in. You saw that Sacramento was interested with him uh, if they're, for their vacant GM spot. So it's quite possible that he gets a, a job, you know, heading into the fall or, you know, maybe at some point next season uh, someone will get him hired as an assistant uh, to the GM. Big night for the Sixers. What do you guys got cooking tonight on Liberty Ballers? Uh, we'll have all sorts of content. I will be at the draft. I'm actually on an NJ trying to train, heading up to Brooklyn as we speak, so we'll try and get some quotes from Markel Fultz. Uh, we have a, Kyle Newbeck will be at the Sixers practice facility tonight, uh, awaiting quotes from Brian Colangelo and Brett Brown. We'll have a whole wrap up of the night uh, coming, you know, not only later tonight, but tomorrow as well. We'll have a full day's worth of content. Definitely check us out at LibertyBallers.com. When you look around that train right now, a lot of Sixer fans going up to New York tonight? You know, I actually did see a couple of Sixers fans heading up. Uh, it was, it's clad in their Sixers gear. Uh, it's a beautiful sight. I imagine there's going to be tons of trust the process chants uh, ringing throughout the Barclays Center. All right, Jake. Great stuff. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Zach. Talk to you soon. There's uh, Jake Pavorsky from Liberty Ballers. Make sure you check him out. Uh, great site as well. And they've been so loyal uh, to the Sixers process uh, that we always do talk about. And I've been someone that... I wasn't originally loyal to the process. I didn't like what Sam Hinkie was doing. But you really start to see that change going into last year. And then you, when you saw in January and then you realized, okay, look at all these moves and look at all these picks that they have and look at what you just got to see for that short, concise period with Embiid, plus the fact that at the time they had the Kings pick, the Lakers pick, uh, with the protections on the uh, Lakers pick, and then it eventually fell through, and then you get that pick unprotected next year, and then the next thing you know, that trade just happens, and that trade, to me, was so significant, not only because you get Markel Fultz, but just the divide in the fan base, because no matter if you were a Brian Colangelo person or not, or Sam Hinkie person or not, I think you finally have to admit that what Sam Hinkie did, it looks like it's going to work. Now, they still got to win games. They still got to have Embiid stay healthy, but it is looking like it will work. And he set this team up very nicely. And then Colangelo, who came in, and after the whole thing happened with the league, forcing out Sam Hinkie, and Colangelo came in, and last year was not good for Brian Colangelo. He was lying a lot. He was not popular with the fan base. People wanted Sam Hinkie back. People still may want Sam Hinkie back. But the deal that he was able to do 
over this weekend was a significant deal, not only for the franchise, but the support of the fan base. Because when they had made that trade, and when you heard the rumors and the rumblings of this trade, you thought to yourself, eh, they may have to give up a lot to get Markel Fultz. And the way that they could still, if they get some fortuitous bounces in the next two years, they could still walk away with the number one overall pick next year and the Kings pick number one. The protections fall really nicely for the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, I don't think they'll get two number one overall picks. That would be a dream. But, hey, we'll let you dream a little bit on draft day uh, being two-day. But with that being said, really, all you lose, and you'll probably lose the Lakers pick next year because I would assume that the Lakers fall two through five. But if they don't, then you either get one or six and on, and then you just lose the Kings pick. But in the ideal world, to me, I think the best case scenario, unless if you hit number one next year with the Lakers— Lose the pick two through five. Let's say it falls at number four or five, and then you get a unprotected Sacramento Kings pick, which I believe is very, very, very valuable. Okay, we'll take a break here on the Zach Gelb Show, Fox Sports 920, the jersey. By the way, the latest with uh, Christoph Porzingis. This is from Mark Stein. Uh, the Celtics, let me just reiterate this. The Celtics remain in trade pursuit of uh, Christoph Porzingis. League sources say trying to assemble package to meet the Knicks' demand. I would be surprised if Kristaps Sporzingis does get traded. I know what Phil Jackson said. It's clear they don't like each other, and it's clear that there is a big-time issue, but I would still be a little bit surprised if a team does meet the demands of the New York Knicks. But if it happens, we'll have to see what they get in return before we could react to that. Okay, Zach Gelb Show, we're coming on back with a little bit of a baseball update and also some more NBA right after this.